Hi there, and welcome to your very first uh, video lecture. Um, this is chapter one out of your textbook, uh, the Withcott book. Uh, it's called Science Behind the Stories, uh, Environmental Science. And this particular chapter is an introduction to the uh, concepts that you're going to be studying and how they kind of all fit together. So go ahead and get your uh, guided reading slash viewing questions out, and let's get started. All right, so in a nutshell, environmental science is two things coming together. It's largely ecology, which is uh, the natural world, which includes both the uh, living and non-living components and how they interact with each other, and then also social science, which is uh, the human component um, and how those two things fit together. So it's both how we affect the environment and how the environment uh, affects us. Uh, do notice all of the different uh, disciplines that go into environmental science. It's everything from ecology to chemistry to biology to geology, the things you would expect to things like history, political science, and ethics. All right, uh, one of the big topics we're going to talk about is how we use our natural resources, which are the things in the natural world that we use as humans for our survival. Um, they can be split into two parts. Renewable, which are things that in our lifetime replenish, and that includes things like sunlight and winded tides, which could be considered perpetual because in our lifetimes they should never run out, to things like uh, water, and when I say water, I mean fresh water, soil, and timber or you know uh, forests. Non-renewable resources are those that on a human scale do not replenish, things like minerals and more importantly fossil fuels. Uh, those types of things take millions of years to form. Um, three, there are three types of fossil fuels, and that would be uh, oil, coal, and natural gas. Now, how do you uh, make a renewable resource into a non-renewable resource? You use it faster than it can replenish itself. So, for example, a forest. If you keep cutting the trees down faster, then the trees can grow back. You've taken a renewable resource and you've turned it into a non-renewable resource. Um, here are some examples again of renewable and non-renewable uh, resources in terms of energy. Uh, energy is something that we're going to talk about a lot in this class. And if you're a flowchart type of person, here they are again. Now please remember as you interact with this video, it's your video. You can pause and go back as many times as you like. So if I'm going through the slides too fast, take the opportunity to go ahead and stop where you are and then go back and review the things uh, that you didn't catch the first time. All right. Um, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the ecology part, so I'm kind of going to talk about the human population part briefly. What are some things that led to uh, the population growths that we've experienced uh, globally? Uh, we started out as hunter-gatherers, small groups, usually family groups of about no more than 50, traveling from fit place to place to uh, get our nutritional needs met. About 10,000 years ago, we went through something called the Agricultural Revolution, which is where we figured out how to domesticate animals and then also how to uh, grow crops. And we no longer needed to look around for our nutritional needs because we provided them in the place that we were. And this is how uh, civilization began to flourish. And this is also when we saw our first explosion of people because searching for food was not an issue anymore. Then in the mid-1700s, we had something called the Industrial Revolution. And besides having the ability to make all the things that we needed uh, quickly, easily, and cheaply, we also came up with techniques that improved the length of our lives and decreased the number of people who uh, died. And so those things include uh, improved sanitation, antibiotics, vaccines, um, industrial agriculture, which means instead of farming little plots, you're farming hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres very efficiently, and then things like synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. All of those things led to a population explosion. All right, um, as this was happening, this guy named Thomas Malthus was an economic uh, guru of his time. Uh, he lived during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and he became very concerned when he saw the population explosion around himself, because in his time, resources, mostly agricultural yield, were increasing in a linear path where our population was growing at an exponential rate, which meant at some point our population would grow larger than we would be able to feed, and things like famine and war 
um, and disease would crop up, uh, leading to wide-scale uh, loss of human life. Uh, his prediction has not come true, and the answer to that is largely because of our agricultural methods. Between industrial agriculture, synthetic uh, pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, we have been able to go ahead and increase the yield of our food supplies at an exponential rate. So we've been able to largely keep up with populations. Now, of course, this isn't true in all places in the world, but it's true in most places of the world. Now, I mentioned two types of graphs before, linear and exponential. You need to understand how this works. Linear increases the amount you increase over a period of time doesn't change. It is a straight line graph. So as you can see here on the slide, slide you have a linear increase uh, in this particular population. This is not the case for humans. Uh, we instead undergo an exponential growth. And this is a reproduction of the figure that you have in, in uh, uh, figure 1.2 in your book. Uh, this is a line graph of the the human race and you can see that any growth we had was minimal perhaps slightly linear and then all of a sudden we have this exponential growth going on and this is right about the time of the industrial revolution that this happened this little dip which you're really not going to need to know until a couple of units from now when we talk about human population that was the black death that was the bubonic plague that was responsible for wiping out a goodish amount of our population exponential growth is the type of thing that starts slowly but grows enormously due to the fact that you double uh, your numbers every certain number of years. So it can kind of sneak up on you. That's one of the things that makes exponential growth kind of deadly when you're talking about populations because you turn around and all of a sudden you've got twice as many people as you had not too long ago. So uh, here is a fable that will exemplify uh, exponential growth. Two ancient kings enjoyed playing chess. The winner claimed a prize from the loser. After one match, the winning king asked the losing king to pay him by placing one grain of wheat on the first square, two grains on the second square of the chessboard, four on the third, and so on, with the number doubling on each square until all 64 squares were filled. The losing king, thinking he was getting off easy, agreed with delight. He bankrupted his kingdom because the number of grains of wheat he had promised was probably more than all the wheat that had ever been harvested very quickly this becomes a problem and when we get to the human populations unit you will actually mathematically uh, figure out a, a doubling uh, population problem where you'll see just at what point it becomes oh my gosh all of a sudden we have a lot of people or in this case uh, grains of wheat <clears throat> excuse me in an area all right um, this is a slide I didn't fix all of a sudden I'm talking about rice wheat, rice, uh, grains of grain. Uh, this right here, the slide shows you exactly how many grains would be on that board when they are done. Uh, it would be a heap of rice or wheat larger than Mount Everest. So again, exponential growth starts out slow, then very quickly becomes a problem. All right, Tragedy of the Commons. Tragedy of the Commons is where it is a resource used by all, policed by none, so you end up with a problem where the resource becomes overused to the point that it's no longer useful to anyone. This uh, term was coined in the mid-60s by Garrett Hardin. And uh, here on the left-hand side of the slide you have two examples. Uh, upper left-hand corner is a grassland which you can see has been overgrazed to the point that it's now basically a dirt pit. Lower right-hand corner is, uh, those are all shark fins that are drying. Uh, shark fin soup is made out of shark fins, and the way that you harvest them is you catch a shark, you slice off its fin, and then you sh throw the shark back in the water because the fin itself is worth more than the rest of that organism uh, put together. Uh, this has led to drastic declines in our shark, shark population, which is responsible for eating largely dead and dying uh, organisms. So a population control is being wiped out right now. The example that we've already talked about in class is Easter Island. That is in the Science Behind the Stories in pages 8 through 9 of your textbook. I do encourage you to read that a little bit better than I'm going over in this video. Uh, Easter Island is an example of the tragedy of the commons. What natural resource did the island's inhabitants deplete? That would be the stones that they used to go ahead and take these uh, 
statues that they made from the center of the island and placed them facing outward around the edges of the island. And the loss of those trees uh, through a variety of reasons, which you can read about in your book, led to poor soil quality because the trees were no longer there uh, to keep the rain from washing it away. Uh, lowered fresh water availability because Again, when you don't have trees and vegetation in the ground, water washes away. Any water that is left is contaminated by dirt. And then also led to a uh, severe depletion of uh, native species because you get rid of the trees, uh, stuff doesn't have a place to live anymore. All right, possible solutions. Uh, this you could see popping up on a national exam. You would need to be able to propose a solution. So anything from creating a law uh, that would include fines and jail time for people who didn't comply. You could limit access to that particular resource, which we do. You're talking about preserves. Uh, you could reduce the human population. That's something we're going to talk about the ethics of a little bit later on. You could privatize access and uh, restrict it. And there are a whole lot of issues involved with that, which we'll discuss at another time. Something I don't have on the slide is public education. Uh, recycling used to not be a thing and now it is a thing through public education. All right, do realize that we currently have laws that regulate access to commonly owned resources and that's largely through things like hunting and fishing licenses. So we are already trying to keep the tra tragedy of the commons from occurring on our planet. Uh, other civilizations that ignore the tragedy of the commons uh, include Greek and Roman civilizations, uh, the Mayans in uh, the Americas, the Anasazi are a are were called the Pueblo Indians, and you can see there in the lower left-hand corner they built elaborate structures in cliff faces, and because they mismanaged their resources, they had to abandon all of that a thousand years before uh, the uh, North America was discovered. So this is a, a North America North American civilization that was dead long before this area was settled by uh, Europeans. And then you also have Middle Eastern civilizations. Remember that the cradle of civilization was between the Tigris and Euphrates. That was the Fertile Crescent. It's now a desert. Um, Iraq, Iran, Syria, that entire area is no longer uh, considered to be very fertile. All right, you need to know what an ecological footprint is. Uh, this is something we already went over in class. The ecological footprint is the amount of biologically productive land and water needed to supply us with the renewable resources we use and absorb and dispose of our waste. Um, when we talk about this, we usually talk about it in terms of per capita, because that lets us know how much we use per person. Per capita means per person. Take a look at the differences here when you look at an entire country versus per capita, like India. Oh boy, they're using a lot, but considering that India is one of the most populous countries in the world, when you actually break it down, uh, their per capita footprint is very, very small. In the United States, you can see, is uh, got per capita one of the highest footprints of any country in the world. Um, let's see what else. Uh, why is this going to be a problem? At some point, probably our footprint, given how many people there are on this planet, which is 7 billion, uh, we're going to run out of resources here at some point. Okay, now that I've talked about environmental science, I really need to remind you about the nature of science because uh, scientific uh, environmental uh, experimental design uh, pops up on the AP exam from time to time. So you guys already know about all of this stuff. So let me explain to you what it is that you're going to need to know. And you're going to want to take a look at pages 11 through 16 of your textbook, focusing on the figure uh, one uh, dot 11 on page 15 of your textbook. You can pause here and kind of skim through that when you come back uh, or even now uh, before you go, hold on a second, uh, formulate a hypothesis, identify independent and dependent variables, establish a control group, establish enough experimental groups to collect a variety of data, explain that to ensure reliable results you should repeat the experiment many times and then also make sure that others can reproduce your results by using your method. Those are all things that you're going to need to be able to uh, explain on a uh, question that requires experimental design in the national exam. So pause here, go ahead and take a look at those pages in your textbook, kind of skim them. 
I'll be here when you get back. Okay. These are some of the sticking points uh, that some students have trouble with, which is uh, being able to tell the independent and dependent variables apart. The independent, uh, independent variable, excuse me, is the thing that you fix, uh, that, that you are changing, excuse me. The dependent variable is the data you collect, what happens. The control group is something that you don't mess with at all. The experimental group is the one that you are uh, manipulating via that independent variable. Your results are going to either show a causation or a correlation when you're talking about environmental science. Did this make this happen? Or do these two things happen at the same time enough that we can say possibly one makes the other happen? Causation is where you absolutely have one making the other one happen. Correlation is where you have two things happening at the same time and you're fairly certain one influences the other, but you don't have definitive proof. Most things that we discovered in environmental science are correlation as opposed to causation. Considering all of the variables that you have in the natural world, it's very difficult to narrow it down to one thing. Um, uh, this is not on your question to be able to tell the difference between qualitative and quantitative da data. Qualitative is words, quantitative is numbers. And uh, there are times when these studies uh, provide us with what's called a paradigm shift, which is a complete refocusing of how we understand the natural world. For example, when we used to think the Earth was the center of the universe, and now we know that the Sun is. Okay, uh, again, we talked about this before. Make sure your uh, experimental procedure is controlled and reproducible. Uh, briefly, don't forget the differences between hypotheses theories and laws. You may want to pause this here and take and read this. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, again, you're going to practice this in class, but be prepared for something like this to pop up on the national exam. All right, so what are the three in, uh, key environmental challenges we face because of our growing population? Um, agricultural needs that lead to the uh, resource overuse, the pollution that we generate, and then loss of biodiversity. Those are the top three things we're going to focus on. Okay, energy needs are a problem as well. Um, our main source of energy happens to be fossil fuels. This is a problem because it's non-renewable. Now, given all of those, how can we avoid a tragedy of the commons? The answer is by living sustainably, which means as you use things, you help those uh, things that you've taken away become replenished so that you never turn a renewable resource into a non-renewable resource. So how do we do that? find alternatives to non-renewable resources that we're using right now. Recycle. Reuse things as much as you can. Reduce the amount of waste that you create. For example, packaging is a huge thing when you get stuff shipped to you in the mail. Flat out use less. How many pairs of shoes do we really need? And then diversify. Uh, right now, most of our energy needs are electricity, which is created through one type of fossil fuel. Why not get a little bit of energy from solar panels, a little bit of energy from uh, from wind power, and then also a little bit of energy from fossil fuels. That is the key for us to go ahead and avoid a global tragedy of the commons. Um, and again, uh, if you want to put this from a, uh, for those of you who understand things from a financial standpoint, leave it, living sustainably means that you uh, live off of your income, not your capital. In other words, you've got all this uh, natural resources in the bank, and you just replenish, you, you put back in what you take out. Uh, living unsustainably is where you just keep taking out and you don't worry about putting back in until you're like, what happened? And uh, then that resource is completely gone. Thus ends your very first um, video lecture.